Hi, I'd like to thank you all for coming here today. My name is Bill Cardalopoulos. I'm the uh, series editor for the Best American Comics series uh, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I'm also the programming director for the MoCA Arts Festival. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be, oh, okay. I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel with um, three uh, artists who I honestly think are um, probably the most exciting and interesting uh, young North American comics artists working today. Uh, when I think about the work that um, Austin English, Aiden Koch, and Blaise Larmy have done, uh, I, I think uh, probably just in the work of those three artists alone, if, you know, unless, unless everything trends badly, which things have a tendency to, uh, you're looking at the work that I think probably suggests um, a lot of uh, f exciting future possibilities for comics. Um, so before we get into uh, the topic at hand, please join me in enthusiastically welcoming Austin, Aiden, and Blaze here today. Um, so basically what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about uh, the, the sort of dynamic between um, these concepts that are, you know, historically constructed and contingent concepts of comics and contemporary art or fine art or the art world uh, as, as we might talk about it. Um, and I think in part uh, one of the reasons that um, Blaze, Austin, and Aiden are producing such exciting work is because they are producing work that sort of troubles those boundaries that used to be very rigid boundaries, and maybe still are, and maybe will continue to be, and that's part of what I'm hoping to explore to find, to, that's what part of what I'm hoping to explore by asking them some questions today, because I think they've had some experience in that area. Just as a very, very brief means of introduction, which I think maybe will also point to why, if you're not familiar with all, all of these artists' work, why they're here today, um, Austin, Blaze, and Aiden all have recent uh, book projects and other projects um, that I think um, uh, indicate the kind of work that they're doing on both sides of this field. Um, Austin uh, most recently has published the book Gulag Casual with the publisher 2D Cloud, which is a collection of five uh, short comic stories produced over the past, I think, five or six years approximately. Um, Austin is also currently uh, doing a very prestigious residency here in New York at the Sharp Walensis. You said you'd pick another photo. Oh, uh, I didn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> this, I think this is a totally fine photo. Uh, the Sharp Walensis Studio Program. This is maybe, you know, Austin can talk a little bit more about this later, uh, but this is a highly competitive, prestigious, one year residency program wherein an artist is given uh, a free studio, large studio for a year, and in addition to being, of course, free studio space, it really, I think, represents a kind of um, inclusion in a, in a community of, of artists. Um, and in even before uh, his uh, participation in that program, but increasingly since then, in addition to making comics like the ones that are collected in Gulag Casual, Austin's also been making a lot of uh, large format single image drawings. These are just a couple of relatively recent examples that I pulled from your website. I know you've produced a lot of work even since uh, these images here. And for those who don't know, uh, Austin English is also the publisher of Domino Books, which is a very uh, small but interesting uh, publishing company that publishes uh, uh, comic books by a number of different artists. The most recent one we see here is called Social Discipline Reader uh, by a Portland-based artist mm -hmm. named Ian Sundahl. So there's, you can see already in, in Austin's work, I think, a range of points of contact, both with comics and the art world. Um, Aiden's most recent book, or forthcoming book, I guess, is uh, After Nothing Comes from Koyama Press, which is debuting at TCAF. Is that true? Yes. Uh, and this is Similarly, a collection of previously published short stories. This is a collection of zines. Uh, I edited this book, although my I feel more like it, a kind of facilitator than anything uh, more creative than that. Um, but this is a collection of short comics that were originally published as zines. Uh, your most um, recent new publication is uh, Little Angels, um, which is, I think, significant to our conversation because this was published as part of Greater New York um, 
could, you could probably even describe it better than I could. Could you say what Greater New York is? Yeah, I don't know if any of you went to it, but Greater New York was at PS1, um, I think, starting like October until it just ended in March. Um, and it happens every five years at MoMA PS1, and it's just kind of supposed to be a survey looking at New York's effect on artists and, and art that informs kind of the experience of uh, New York. Yeah, and this is technically published by PS1, right? Which mm -hmm. is, uh, um, I guess, I don't even know what to call it, a division of MoMA. It's yeah. It's a it's sort of the hip contemporary art <laughs> museum of MoMA. Um, and you've you've been showing your work a lot. Your um, most recently you have a show. You have work in a three person show up right now at a yes, that closes tomorrow. Closes tomorrow. You can so still if you haven't, make it. yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, you still have a chance if you go there before 6 p.m. today or tomorrow. So this is a three-person show in a, you know, uh, gallery. And where is this, the Lower East Side, or is this in Chelsea? Yeah, it's like Eldridge mm -hmm. and Orchard. Was okay. that possible? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're showing your work. You're making comics. That, you know, in some cases, like this book published by a comics publisher, and in the case of Little Angels, making a comic that's published by a fine arts institution. Um, and Blaze has a number of... Uh, recent projects. Um, your last book that you were the sole author of is three books, which came out, um, I think, in the fall, this past fall from 2D Cloud. Is that true? Mm, might have been spring last year. OK. But it came out last year, sometime in 2015, yeah. from 2D Cloud, a collection of three uh, bodies of work. Um, most recently, you're the editor of Mirror Mirror, uh, which is an anthology. And you are also the ongoing creative director of the comics publisher 2D Cloud, which, among other projects, publishes uh, Mirror Mirror, published three books, and published Gulag Casual uh, by Austin English. Um, so uh, as I was preparing for this uh, slideshow, I was looking for something on Tumblr, and I noticed that um, this month is Art Appreciation Month for the comics publisher IDW. Um, so they've produced a number of fascinating um, variant covers for their titles. Oh, that is cool. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and it, it was nice. funny just to find this exactly when I was looking for um, oh, images for a, a panel about art and comics. This is not at all what I was looking for, um, but I just found it very amusing. Um, uh, this this Whoa. one is my favorite, but oh my <laughs> anyway, but this is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the collision of <laughs> comics in the art world, nor, nor am I thinking of, you know, Starenko appropriating Dali or, or anything like that. Similarly, I'm not that interested in the fine art world appropriating comics ranging from the kind of typical example of like Lichtenstein in the pop art moment or the contemporary pop artist Jeff Koons who made this uh, Popeye statue that sold for $28 million. Um, but that also tells you something about that world. Um, so I was trying to think, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about some stuff and then I'm going to ask some questions. I was thinking about what does it mean to talk about you know, comics per se and its relationship to the art world or, or, or the um, contemporary art or, or the world of fine art, the way we historicize it or theorize it. Uh, and I was thinking about a few different ways. I came up with seven. There's probably more, uh, but just to get things started. The first was I was thinking how there are some comics artists who in a way um, kind of have sort of made it to, maybe to some small extent into the art world. They get cited, uh, maybe even, you know, they have pieces in a handful of, you know, major institutional collections. And usually it's when there's some work that just has, like, undeniable aesthetics, you know, like Windsor McKay or Crazy Cat or historical examples. Contemporary examples might include Chris Ware, whose work was in the Whitney Biennial. We might also mention Crum, who has a big show opening at the David Swerner Gallery in London pretty soon. Um, and there's something about the work where it's so distinct it's as unusual within the world of comics, in a way, as it is within any other artistic context you might want to put it in. So it's undeniable aesthetics. What this often leads to is stuff that is good, but not very engaged with comics in the sense of like 
traveling exhibit of work by Dan Klaus, for example. It just means that at some point, some curator decided that Dan Klaus has an undeniable aesthetic. But then often when they write about the work, they don't necessarily seem to have thought too deeply about comics and what makes comics art. It's just that the, it has an undeniable aesthetic. So that's one way. Another way is um, to talk about it in terms of like comic-specific aesthetics. And this is something that I think the institutional world has a real hard time with. Um, but it's also something that people within the comics world, the fan culture, can overrate too, which is the idea that there are aesthetics that emerge very specifically from comics because of the formal and historical and material conditions under which they're created. So like Mutt and Jeff by Bud Fisher has like a super unique and actually kind of interesting set of aesthetics. It's something that like Phil Gustin references in his work. Um, or Dick Tracy by Chester Gould has a super unique and interesting type of aesthetics, both in terms of form and style and composition and all that stuff. But it's hard to get uh, I think institutions to take that seriously. Um, uh, you know, it's a, just a kind of popular art. I know Austin, for example, you've been talking to me about some stuff you've been reading recently. And like, I mean, you've been looking at Johnny Craig EC comics and Kurt Swan Superboy comics. Like, do you see that work as being aesthetically on par with work from other areas or even from more self-consciously experimental or artistic comics? Yeah, I I do. I could totally like understand other people not. I wouldn't. When I look at like that Kurt Swan page, I really I think it's so beautiful and the story is like so strange and it's just just the images of themselves. Like it, it's so comforting to look at them and I just think the composition is so beautiful on each panel and the page as a whole. But I could totally understand someone that was really into fine art and had a really specific aesthetic of what they liked or even we're into really like out there comics and them looking at that and getting nothing from it. And I would totally respect that. Cause I don't even know, I've been reading comics for so long mm -hmm. that I just feel like so keyed in to what both of those artists are doing. But I do know that I show, sometimes I show stuff like that to people that are outside of comics and they just have like, no, they're like, you could, you can just tell they have like no reaction to it. So I just, I think it might be something, I think those two artists in specific, you might get really into them if you, really love comics, but I can totally understand it going over other people's heads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another way that we can talk about um, art and comics, of course, is just uh, comics that have maybe a more sophisticated influence of visual art from outside the world of comics, not just, you know, the, the appropriation of, you know, or reference to Van Gogh in the context of a Donald Duck comic or whatever, although, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, but, I mean, I think, Austin, with your work, you know, there's, um, it's quite clear that even though you're using the form of comics, you have a lot of aesthetic influences from outside of comics. Yeah. I, but I just, I always, I, I, I must have been, when I was, I was developing, making this work, I must have just made some kind of uh, mistake where I didn't think, um, like, I know, and obviously looking at that next to those <laughs> Kurt Swan bitches that you just showed, it's pretty different. But to me, it's like I, I um, you know, uh, when I was growing up, my mom had a lot of art books around the house that I looked at. And I also had these Tintin books. And I got into both. Um, I just, like, would look at them. And to me, I always liked making comics. And I kind of just, um, I didn't... Uh, really see the barrier between the two different aesthetics so much. And I was like, oh, you can make a... I remember, like, making a comic when I was a little kid and trying to um, make the character look the same in one panel to the next one. That seemed like the rule of comics. And I remember having a really hard time doing that. But I was like, oh, well, I'll just keep going anyway. And so I guess that's sort of what I sort of do in comics. But I don't... Yeah, I don't really think of it as, as like... Um, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make comics that are influenced by this certain uh, thing that's in the art world. I just, I, I just think that stuff's open to you, and I just, I don't know. I just think it's something that you're, you're totally allowed to use, but it's not maybe a conscious decision of using it. Just kind of, the way I always describe my comics is I, in the first panel, I try to make them normal and simple and communicate information, information effectively like a Johnny Craig comic. And maybe I can sort of do it for half a panel, and then it falls apart by the next panel, and I kind of just like mm -hmm. go where it goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
You know, one of the other ways to talk about uh, like the art world and comics is comics, um, you know, like influenced by the art world, but also comics engaging with art world discourse in a number of ways. And of course, one of them is just through sheer participation. Um, and I think, Aiden, that's something you've been doing a lot. I mean, your work is, is uh, in galleries. Uh, you know, this is an exam just a, one installation shot from uh, the current show. I was also very interested in some uh, things that I, I've seen that you've done recently where you're making things that are like comics pages that are in a kind of narrative sequence, but they seem very specifically designed for the gallery space or for the mm -hmm. kind of installation type. Um, of environment, and um, one thing I want, and even with your publications, you know, uh, 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 After Nothing Comes is from Koyama Press, but like we were saying, Little Angels is published by MoMA, essentially, and Impressions came out from an art book publisher, Paradam, uh, or artist's book publisher is maybe a more accurate descriptor. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you about um, this, uh, I guess, um, type of participation, you know, going from a world of zines and comic book people and sort of bringing comics into the gallery environment. Did you ever encounter any resistance to the idea of narrative or sequence or comics per se or anything like that? Not at all. Um, which is part of what's interesting. I mean, I think it is this like visibility difference and that's kind of it. I mean, just like, I feel like I'm very maybe socially visible in the art world a little bit more. Like I go to openings all the time. I always go to museums. Like I, yeah, I mean, participation is a good word. Like I'm, I'm like physically involved. Um, I mean, I think what's funny is that so like, and as I've been showing more, um, like some people who came out last night, um, we did like a comics reading at this gallery. And so I had friends here who came who had no idea that I'd published graphic novels because um, they've just seen my work in shows. So, I mean, I think it's been this thing of being like, oh, like I, I do this whole other body of work and it's kind of both sides are blind to the other mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I like stay very actively engaged in both all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if anything, I feel like most places I've worked with are excited that I have comics um, or that I'm bringing that into it. Mm -hmm. um, usually like, you know, in a studio visit or something, I think that it, I don't know, in art you can kind of talk about anything and work comes from so many diverse places and there's so many diverse practices mm -hmm. that it doesn't necessarily feel different to the curator or to the gallerist or whatever. They understand that, that that's just like my artistic process. Mm -hmm. um, which I mean, maybe they don't necessarily label it as comics the way that I do mm -hmm, might be mm -hmm. a difference. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they just see it as my practice. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, actually. This is something I was thinking of mentioning, um, you know, because uh, I think, I think um, one of the things that's you know, interesting to me about this or seeing sometimes pages uh, by any of you in the gallery environment is that I really enjoy seeing art that I can read as comics in a 3D setting. Um, but I think uh, probably, especially for you, Aiden, in Austin, it's like, it's at best maybe considered part of a practice. And that maybe it has to include other things. Um, like I, and, and I think some of it has to do, like you were saying, they don't call it comics. I think there's a kind of vocabulary thing mm -hmm. and a theoretical thing. Because I remember, Austin, you had some... Um, I've seen your work shown a few times over the last few years. Most recently was at a, um, a small artist-run gallery in uh, Bushwick, I guess. Mm -hmm. And they showed a few pages from your comic stories there. And, uh, but they weren't like in any kind of particular, it wasn't like here's 10 pages in a row that you can read and get a story. It was just like a few pages on the wall. And I was talking to that, which is fine, but I was talking to the, um, the artist who curated the show, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something like, yeah, Austin's pages look really good on the wall. And he just went, yeah, pages, right. Like, I mean, not in a condescending way at all, but it was just this kind of encounter between two like completely different vocabularies where it's just like, it's a drawing or it's work made on paper or something like that. Well, I always, when 
when I started when I started showing work like that, people and I hear it all the time. People are always like, "Yeah, you know, it's like, like you don't even like, like these look so, these comic spaces look so interesting, but you know, what if like you know there weren't any like words and like you know like <laughs> sequence? Like, what does that even matter?" And it's like you know, I mean, there's there's people like Aiden is describing that are really that they really understand that, but there also are I think a lot of people in that world that they don't care at all about narrative or and if they just don't understand if you're making imagery that they recognize as interesting to them they're, they're just like why would you do why <laughs> would you make it why would you have it be part of a series that's supposed to be printed in a book that just doesn't because and it, you know it makes sense like those people are involved in a world where you look at work on a wall and and it's supposed to be that's supposed to be the end result of it and it's not supposed to have anything extra and yeah, the idea of looking at a whole sequence of images, you know, sometimes you do a book that has like, you know, like a 160-page a book. I mean, that's that's a bit much to, to show anywhere. So I, it makes sense, but I also think it's, I, 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 you know, I've been hearing lately, like the last year, like, oh, the art world is really opening up to comics or, or uh, the comics world is really opening up to the art world. And I guess it's true in maybe one way or a small way, but I do think that, the art world is is not as uh, I think they they they'll accept that someone does comics, but they won't be like really excited about it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the same way that the comics world is pretty pretty closed off from the art world for the most part. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, they might know some superficial examples, but but then again, it's like a lot of stuff to keep up with. You know, yeah. you can keep up with all of avant garde comics. That's enough. <laughs> Does that sort of sim sympathize with your experience? Or were you about to say something? Yeah, I feel like it's worth remembering that, like, we're seen as cartoonists in this world, but, like, Aiden is an artist in the art world, and Austin's an artist, and they also have other identities that you can point to, like, Ian and a cartoonist in the cartoon world, and it's, it's not the, you know, it's, it's a different person than you're seeing now, and that we're different in different social capacities yeah. and stuff, so it's a different... It's not like how were you accepted as because you're a different person in that world mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's it's a different identity. It's yeah. not necessarily like you have to take this cartoon thing with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I mean that's been something that I've been trying to do like with the actual work I'm showing in galleries mm -hmm. is like it's not my pages. It's not something that's meant to be printed mm -hmm. immediately. Um, like when, something like this isn't. It's got some of the qualities that are in your comics, but yeah. it's not actually a page from a book. No, but it, but it's from a series of four that is narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but the approach was different in the way that I made it and the way that I knew it was going to exist. Like, the four pieces aren't hanging next to each other in the gallery even. Mm -hmm. And, like, I figured that would happen. So it's, like, the way that it's constructed is, like, specific to that setting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, in that terms, too, like, that's, you know, why a lot of artists and friends of mine, like, haven't seen any of my graphic novels. Because those are existing in the comics world. Yeah, this work is in this Another world. good example is, like, Aiden's, like, tumblers where she has Aiden Coke <laughs> 1 through 5. Yeah. Each one is, like, a discrete <laughs> example of her existence, like, through images. Like. Yeah. And some people only know number 2. <laughs> some people know number 5. Mm -hmm. it all, it's changing. <laughs> well, it plays this idea of um, sort of identity is uh, totally relevant to what I want to talk about next, which was engaging with the art world discourse through presentation. Because I feel like that's a big part of what you've always done in your own work, but that you've also brought to 2D Cloud as the creative director. Because, I mean, I, I've seen, you know, stuff that 2D Cloud did before your involvement, and this is just like, uh, I think, the current screen grab of, of what the website looks now, even though it's always mutating, and you also run the Instagram and whatever. And, um, uh, you know, this is, you know, the cover of Mirror Mirror number one, and I noted that the description of the book on the website, this book that you edited, this anthology, called it an exhibition of 10 artists in print. So um, it seems that there's a kind of self-conscious framing here. Would yeah, you agree with yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> it's embarrassing a little because it's saying it's like, it's, uh, but you, it's like, um, like the, the reader after, there was a reading last night, the reader after Aiden was, you know, she, at the intro, it was like contextualizing, like <coughs> this poem that I'm about to read was framed in purple, you know, and like mounted on a wall, like 
this is an art context. I'm in this context, from this context. It's like presenting yourself as like, you know, maybe even more privileged than you are or something. Like, it's like, can you stand and like say that? And it's like, I am saying that. And it's like, but yeah, it's like, it can be embarrassing, but it's also like, but that's what it deserves this value sort of that I, and, and the whole like inside presentation like tries to stand by that where it's like, it's really like, I'm, yeah, like, like, like a half the book is like just blank pages. So it's like, I'm devoting a lot of space to these specific things. Like, you know, yeah, there's, it's, I guess like creating that void, that's like an aspect where it's like, I just want one image in like a whole room and like I can just sit, sit with that for a while, you know. And there's room for the opposite too, but mm -hmm. that's like a, a basic art viewing kind of way you're used to. So the, the blanks, uh, the blank pages of Mirror Mirror is sort of equivalent to the kind of like generous spacing that people expect in a kind of gallery context so that they can focus more intensely on each individual piece. Yeah, and it's also like each, like the sheets were printed on one side, so it's more like this, where you don't usually see the back of a work on paper or something, mm -hmm. or it's like uh, that kind of presentation. Well, and that's like the exact opposite of traditional comics, where the white space between images is often minimized as much as possible, and it's, it's almost about forgetting, it's, it, it, experiencing their discreteness. This stuff I can't even look at. It's like too much information at once. It's like <laughs> crazy. But then seeing Aiden, like it's hard to think of anyone going so far the opposite. Like just like white space. Like there's like a six panel grid and it's like this big and it's just in the corner here. And like <laughs> to me I bet it's just images that work together and function together and are strengthened together. And that's mm -hmm. I to me that's enough of a connection for those artists that were just on the screen to Aiden's work to have some kind of, I don't know, they, they, I, it's, they're part of the same sphere of interest to me. And I think they, you know, uh, they can, your understanding of one can be enriched by exposing yourself to the other. Um, and I, I think just images relying on each other and feeding off of each other, I think that's something I've had a really hard time um, teaching my, I'm trying to teach myself to do that now to, just make an image that exists on its own. And I think um, maybe, the, I don't know if it's true for, for you guys, but for the appeal of comics is that there's an image next to another one and they, they just have, they, they multiply in power next to each other. Um, and I see that in the, the more traditional stuff we saw and then in the image of Aiden's work. It's that thing of narrative. And it doesn't, I don't think it does exist in our world in the same way at all, where it can't be located in a piece. It has to be like the narrative is like your Felix Gonzalez stories or something, and like it was about your lover, and it comes out, and each piece is like a little piece of you, like your narrative or your clothes or something. But I think, like, I just, um, there's this Alicia Gibson show at this gallery, Canada, and Blaze just went to see it, and I thought that show was kind of like what I get from comics because it's these phrases written in, it's like she does oil paintings and she writes out phrases really really strongly and if you look at all the work in the show you really get there's, there's there was so much work in the show and you really can get this person's whole personality from all the stuff being together all these phrases and ideas and then there's little pieces of paper with like little secrets written on it and it's just like together through imagery and text being grouped together you get some kind of like full which you know, I mean, portrait. yeah, is like the point of like a solo show yeah it's yeah. like seeing how someone's full language develops and like complements itself yeah. and works together. Um, and in my definition, that's enough to be a comic. That's a super liberal definition. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I, when, like with books, you control the architecture in which you're yeah. read, sort of, and that's the beautiful thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's why like an anthology is kind of challenging since it is like the idea of approaching a group show where it's like diverse languages that you're having to somehow yeah, exists put within. forth in a way for people to make sense of it or, like, mm -hmm. be able to absorb it all instead of just, like, you know, there's, like, you know when you go to a bad group show. <laughs> like, because nothing, you just, like, yeah. you want to get out. Because mm -hmm. um, things don't complement each other and you, like, can't look at, you can't absorb all that information at once. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so it's like, and that's where you out. really might want to reduce yourself or something. But there's also yeah. this thing with reduction. Austin's the opposite, where it's just like so, like, and maybe even reaction to that somewhat, where it's like you see all this reduction to just like a blank, whatever, dry something thing. And Austin talked about that a bit. Just, it, the images are just so worked on and so worked into, and like, you know, he seems to like lose himself in this for those hours drawing, like. Yeah, <laughs> some some to do. <laughs> but there's also like a standard reduction thing, like the white, and there's that's built in the reaction to that too. But just through reduction, creating this chapel-like thing or void thing, where some single thing can be meditated on, contemplated, like an image or something, and that's like a shortcut, and it doesn't have to be the only way. But that's something maybe Aiden and I both use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that actually leads very nicely to the next thing that I was thinking about, is particularly in relation to your work, Blaze, is uh, a way of comics engaging the art world, engaging with art world discourse through critique or through parody, which is can be a kind of critique. Um, and I was thinking about a couple of different aspects of your work. The one are these images where you're discussing, you're just describing these spaces as these like inviolable chapel-like spaces. And then you sort of invade them by taking these gallery shots and drawing these uh, characters of yours who interact with the space in a way that would be considered uh, inappropriate or you know you know problematic uh, to the gallery owner certainly um, in in real life. And I was thinking also about, of course, um, some of the uh, text in three books where it's um, very much about the kind of narrative of the you know cusp of stardom gallery artist and you take this work of yours and present it um in a way that i believe is manipulated uh as if these you know what i think are small paintings were presented as massive canvases along with a big uh, with it with a narrative that i mean to me you know sounds like it rings true but also sounds like it comes from the experience of having read a lot of stories <laughs> like this yeah. or having read this type of voice right like and by yeah. sort of satirizing it in a way i think there's a critique involved there is it's this weird thing i was realizing like i i was kind of late to art anyway i got this whole art contemporary thing through this 90s thing of Art is discourse based, and the way that's reflected, where specifics. Anyway, now it seems like this thing, it's kind of like the 80s I just realized yesterday, where it's like there's this discourseless kind of moment in art, and at the same time, discourse is appearing in these marginalized identity based groups. Uh, and the, it's, there's a, it's a very strange the way that splits up and so it's it's so now I'm in the struggle and and so the last book I did it was like three years of like trying to reckon trying to still do a discourse based thing with social justice being the only basic kind of to me seeing surviving popular discourse like interesting or anything just living so able to exist on a public level on a way on a scale that I'd want to engage with and just totally failing because the two cannot be they can be i just it's it's no i don't think so they just can't be it it it, it just couldn't work i just couldn't do it maybe personally i just couldn't but one one other thing like when the, the characters are standing on the thing it's not that it, it's more like they're embodying discourse it's like just being in that space specific these specific bodies you know it's like and also part of that body is like a drawing, a comics, it's representing a, you know, a different level. All the, it's just specific. It's the specific body, and that's all, you know, ultimately, I'm contributing to it. Like, this is a body in the space. Like, that's what I have to, like, that's, that's my contribution to this image of mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. like, um, to, in a way, um, though, I, I'm, it sounds like you're, um, a lot of the things that you felt like you were trying to reconcile and bring together in three books were um, all involved with the kind of uh, discourse and, and ethics uh, around the art world. 
but within that context, there's also, I think, a kind of, um, I don't know if it's separate from that or attempting to insert comics into that discourse. I mean, there is a very, there are a lot of interesting ideas about what comics can be. I mean, uh, even putting apart, putting aside this idea of comics exhibiting, exhibited as massive paintings in a gallery, even just the idea that you could create a, an image of comics in a 3D space, for example, is very interesting. I mean, do you feel like you um, succeeded in some ways uh, in terms of maybe um, rethinking some ideas about what comics could be in particular? Oh, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard because, like, I don't think of these mostly as good paintings. I think on that level, and especially once I have the text in there, it can only be read as comics. And then I think... Even recently, like, I'd rather people see the version online that's just photographs of the book, like the entire book documented, where it's, you're confined to this linear thing where if you try to read it as an art book, it just, uh, it has to be this linear. That is the driving thing. Like, the text is all this peripheral vision. Like, oh, it's, like, kind of art, it seems like, in the background, but you're just focused on the text. And, like, yeah, the paintings are kind of, like, in the background, blurred out. You don't see it as much. Mm -hmm. Um, and the the last um, uh, the last one of these kind of categories that I sort of thought of when I was preparing my slides for this panel was um, something that uh, I feel like we I uh, tried to suggest um, and it's something I've thought a lot about and tried to suggest in the last best American comics was the idea of viewing art as comics, as opposed to this whole notion of how can comics be art, thinking of how can art be comics. This is similar to what Austin was saying, too, this idea of going to an exhibit and feeling like having an experience that's similar to reading a comic. And, you know, well, the, the cover artists for this volume of Best American Comics were very lucky to have a piece by Raymond Pettibone, who some of you are probably familiar with. He's done, he designed the logo for Black Flag and did the cover for Goo by Sonic Youth and has a very, he's a very successful contemporary artist, I think it's fair to say. Um, and he had a show in Chelsea that included a lot of interesting material and the material, I didn't get to see the show, but the material, um, Austin, you saw the show and I remember you telling me about it. And the material was published in a catalog by the gallery, gallery David Sorner Books. Um, and I was looking at that material in the book and I was like, well, the, if we can get him to agree to allow to have his work printed in the context of a comics anthology, there's no reason why we couldn't present work like this as comics. It's just, it's comics with adventurous aesthetics and, uh, you know, an adventurous approach to form. But whether, you know, your preoccupation is pictures in sequence or word and image or whatever, I mean, it's all there, you know, and it's even highly figurative and so on. And, you know, from that point, you can extend outward into the present and the deep past of history in a variety of art forms. And throughout art history, there's a lot of people like, you know, Ida Applebrook, for example, um, is an example who comes up sometimes, uh, who make work that relies very heavily on sequence, or Dwayne Michaels, uh, who's produced a large body of photo sequences with text. Um, and um, I also, you know, I, I uh, you know, my thinking on this subject, I think, um, has a lot of sympathy with what, for a while, Blaze, was your project on alt comics, the Tumblr that you maintained for a long time, which seemed, without putting in any commentary or any heavy theorizing, just by throwing things up onto the blog and just saying, oh, this is a comics blog that included things like the material that I just showed or you know, photo books or whatever um, suggested, among other things, that there's, you know, if depending on how you want to look at things, there's a lot of stuff, you know, instead of worrying about how do we get comics into the art world, there's a lot of stuff already in the art world that we could identify as comics if we wish to. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel that. I mean, um, sometimes it feels tokenizing, um, but, and there's less choices, but some specific examples, like uh, there's this artist, Amelie von Wolfen, and, like, she does these comics, and they're just straight-up comics, and they're presented as such, and they're just incredible. Uh, but you don't see that, like, 
and I, I, yeah, I mean, the social is, I'm the least socialized in the art world, I think, of anyone here, and I didn't know whether to contact her gallery, or how to, I tried to, there was like a language barrier, it's like she's German represented, so I did, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, it's interesting <laughs> is you, when you say you're the least socialized person uh, in the art world on the panel, I feel like you're the one who um, is maybe, seems to me, or maybe it's just because you articulate a lot more, the most conversant with uh, discourse around contemporary art. Yeah, the whole publication arena of, uh, th th that's what's, I mean, there's so much beautiful work in that, and that's how I experience art in a basic way. It's always mediated. And I think that distance also allows me to, you know, I, I, me partly I need that to feel like it's worth it or like it's still something to strive for because it seems like I don't know how shitty it really is or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from Aiden in Austin since, you know, over the last few years you have been more and more involved um, with, you know, what we might think of as the field of contemporary art. Did you feel like there was a lot to learn just in terms of language or even values in terms of how um, that field as a kind of professional or uh, I mean, I, conceptual field operates? Because I went to like an art school, mm -hmm. um, but I studied illustration. And I mean, I do feel like even in school, there was like a division mm -hmm. of the way people thought and created work. And I was in the commercial sector, mm -hmm. um, but I was pretty much like only around people who were more like, um, uh, what's the word? I, I mean, who are more <laughs> experimental, like art artists. Um, Better. <laughs> Would you? What was the, you liked more, the people that you liked more. Oh, I mean, we just, like, I don't know. Like, the conversations or something about, like, that just ended up being the people that I, like, most it became emotionally attached with. Um, yeah, it really became my friend group. So, I mean, I think that it, like, I was really intrigued always by what they're working on, what their conversations were, um, what, you know, what they got to be reading. Um just because it wasn't offered to me. So, I mean, I think through that, though, and staying involved in that way and always being around people who are, like, really pursuing, like, being an artist. Mm -hmm. When I was kind of, like, wishy-washy, mm -hmm. um, doing illustration and doing comics, and then, you know, I really haven't, like... I didn't really, like, show seriously, I guess, until, like, t a two years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, now I, like, maybe feel like... I'm an artist too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I was like very exposed mm -hmm. the whole time. So I think that helped me be comfortable with it or, you know, I know how people think mm -hmm. and talk mm -hmm. better. I, I don't think there was any change in uh, language or anything. I think it was more, um, I think showing stuff in, in the art world, I just get, I think there's just a more diverse range of reactions to what I do than in the comics world. I just, it like, it shows that this, for years, I'll, I'll show work, and people will pick it up and go like, whoa, this is just like, this is so weird, like, what is, is this even, I don't even, and, you know, I think in the art world, it's like, this kind of stuff is, I actually don't think this stuff is that weird. In the mm -hmm. comics world, it's, diff yeah. it's different than normal comics. But I think in the art world, it's nice to have people see this and they'll have maybe more personal reactions in it because it's in the context of all the crazy stuff that happens there. It's just, it's just image making mm -hmm. and it's just, um, you know, it's, it's almost conservative. It's mm -hmm. figurative uh, work mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's not conceptual. Um, but I do think that it, in terms of like um, learning something, I think, I, I think being immersed in both worlds is like a real aesthetic education. I do think... Um, I think maybe being years ago, I think when I was just focused on what was happening in comics, I do think your the kind of imagery that you're you find acceptable becomes a little dull, and I think going out and see and being more aware of what's happening day to day in you know in all kinds of uh, in, in all kinds of galleries in the city, you do get you you see people you see work that you don't connect with at all. You see work that you were hoping to, the, the kind of aesthetics that you were hoping to see, and it makes you appreciate certain kinds of imagery, and also makes you appreciate imagery in comics to, to a degree, too. So I really think, I just think being exposed to all different kinds of practices 
only makes you a more um, open person to all kinds of expression and only heightens your level of, uh, you know, understanding of what, what anyone does with imagery or, or expression in general. So I don't think it changed language in any way, but it did make me, I, you know, maybe sides of myself that might have become more conservative, maybe it made me let go of that or, or maybe become a little more conservative if I, saw, if I see stuff that's like, like too, uh, too out there even for me. So I, I, but I think it's, I, I actually really like being on, I feel like being on, I'm on safari in both worlds. Like mm-hmm. I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't have a tight grip in either one, but it feels really healthy in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, going, I mean, seeing art regularly, I think you just have that thing where you're like, you can literally do anything. Yeah. You can do anything. And it's like, there it is. It's like in a gallery. It's um, but it's also this level of privilege. It's like so we don't yeah. even know how they got in there. Like because <laughs> yeah. anyone could like. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like we do. It's like uh, you were talking at the beginning of like, um, or you're you're talking about Pettibon being like, and he agreed to be in the. Well, we were, yeah, but it's a it's a problem, and that's where the money kind of aspect of it comes in too. Because I can imagine a gallery. I mean, we're very lucky that actually David Swerner Gallery was very amenable to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I I remember. I curated a show several years ago, and I wanted to include an artist who's deceased and has a foundation. And the the foundation didn't want to give me permission to include work in an exhibit that had the word cartoon in the title. Yeah. And it required a lot of discussion Mm -hmm. to sort of bring it around. And fortunately, I was able to do what I wanted to do. But going into that situation and also having heard of other situations like that, I did feel like I was, and it's, I'm not, I didn't say that, but I should clarify, not because like he's a god and no. we're lesser mortals because we're not fine yeah, artists or no. like, or whatever, you know, but yeah. I just mean, it's like, yeah. I, I really like Pedamon's work. I love that show, but I also, it's like, in terms of cartoonists, I don't, he's not like my favorite cartoonist. And I, if I was him, I'd no. be like, oh wow, I'm so honored that, uh, this, uh, this best American comics anthology is asking me someone who doesn't even really, uh, you know, do comic stuff anymore, they're asking me to be in this thing. And I, I just think it's, I mean, it's... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, ultimately, but, but at that level, think, you're not... I think it's crazy that, like, we we do have this weird idea about... Um, status. Yeah, yeah, the status of the art world. And I think, I love um, Crazy Cat by George Harriman. That's, like, my favorite work of art ever. And, you know, you go to MoMA, and there is an artist, I forget her name, but she had made a decent career appropriating crazy cat imagery and her stuff looks really cool she isolates the best drawings from crazy cat and um light boxes them and and puts them on a canvas and and they're there but george harriman is like one of the greatest uh, living american artists he has this huge body of work that people really respond to and i think it's just such a bizarre thing like moma should be begging the george harriman estate like oh please please let us have some George Harriman. But it's like, they're like, no, nah, we don't really need any. But they do, but then there's contemporary artists. There's um, um, there's a, a current artist who who takes a lot of cartoon imagery and mashes it all together, and those images look really cool. But I just it's just such a weird thing. It's like, these this cartoon imagery is art when we say it is, and it just, I don't know. I mean, I just think it's something the comics world could just be more like, a little more assertive about in some way. Or maybe that's crazy, but there, I just don't think they, we, we have these like distinctions in our mind, but I don't know. It's the, like, the, you know. There, there's a lack of funds in the comics world that's real, it seems, and there's oligarchs closer to the art world and a bigger art school kind of population going there. And there's a big difference in like what's the scale of one and the scale of the other and what's capable. And based on that, like the stat, you're like sort of the pride you can take in whatever your identity is. I think designer is a potential, like, middle class. That's a scene as this also kind of, like, fantasy, like, how it's, it's so de-skilled. Like, how anyone could do it almost work. But it's just, like, you just always present the same, like, perfect, you know, it's like, there's the image. You know, like, there's the, the thing. It's like, but I'll it's like. put the text. <laughs> there. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> the, the, that's a potential, like, middle class, like, democratic uh, identity everyone could take on maybe being unified. And when I present stuff, really I've found it's like, it seems at first like art world presentation, but really it's like design. That's what's, you know, it mm-hmm. seems like I could use this as a design as, portfolio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You mean like what you do with 2D Cloud? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be like, I, it, again, that plays a in thing. It's, it's like, a democratic, like a photo of a thing. Mm-hmm. It's all the scale, everything. It's like you could put anything under this camera and it's like, 
uh, redeemed in the same way by showing it in this kind of way. But I guess even like the idea of like a privileged aesthetic or something kind of where it's like, yes, because, you know, I can have things be sparse because we have all the space we need or something. Yeah, right, There's like an right, attitude right. that goes along with it about like good design. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think. It's like, and I was, yeah, like. Well, what gallery would want to have like a super Baroque presentation on their website with like gold edging and stuff to <laughs> point out like, you know, how. Frames. You know, involved they are but with the windows yeah. wide open for that. That one, like people would be like, "Whoa, these people yeah. are doing their own." Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's just like the evolution too that happened. I mean, in comics, are still like, I mean, I think just because like work. I mean, I mean, maybe it hasn't shown that long. I mean, how long have galleries really been a thing? I mean, before, I mean, it would be like paintings and houses and stuff. It is like this lavish kind of decorative mm -hmm. thing. Now it's contemporary or daily. You're just getting like. 20 megabytes a day of the exact same, like, white background. Like, yeah. it really feels like a thing now. Yeah. Definitely. But then you can go, there's, like, you can go all those, all those great galleries on the Upper East Side that, you know, you can see, like, old, uh, you know, Max Ernst paintings in some show that some collector is showing. And those, I, I feel more comfortable in those because it's someone's home that they've turned into a gallery, and mm -hmm. it's not white walls. And the work does feel... Even though it's artists that are way more uh, more gravitas to their history, it just feels like more approachable because it's not in this. Um, like when you go into the hole, like they, <laughs> the lights in there are so bright. It's like mm. really, and I guess that's the point. You yeah. feel really intimidated because you're like so bright, you know, <laughs> like dirty, and the windows are so huge. Everyone can yeah. see you in there. Like, yeah, perfectly lit. Um, one thing I want to say is, uh, you know, I, I think kind of the, I just thought I'd put that up since we're talking about white walls. Um, you know, I, I want to kind of pick up on two things, you know, like on the one hand, you know, Aiden, you were pointing out how the, one of the things that is exciting about the art world is this feeling that you can do anything. And someone can come along and make something out of any material you can imagine. It can be anything that seems like a, an appropriation or a super rough statement or a very highly elaborated statement in any kind of media I'm using, you know, I mean, if you can, if you can sort of create the situation, um, anything is possible. You can transform a space using algae or, I mean, whatever. I mean, there's a lot that you could do. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but, um, it's an you know, but you could, it's an yeah. option. And, you know, on, but on the other hand, there is also this, um, uh, thing that both you and Austin have talked about where it does sound like, there is a little bit of a double tracking where it's like, well, I'm in this world and in that world. And so, I mean, it does kind of beg the question of like, can you do anything you want in the art world except just make your comics and only make the comics and participate in the world that way? Yeah, just, I mean, just because the financial structures are so different mm -hmm. and based on such different principles. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, I mean, even what you're saying, like, the idea that someone wouldn't lend you something for a cartoon show because, like, mm -hmm. the word cartoon would then, like, depreciate the value if people see that associated with that artist. Um, and it's, like, so it's, like, it's not necessarily about the standing. It's about the, the money, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so until, and that's why I think, like, you know, to me, institutions should be, like, the ones maybe that are, like, helping support cartoonists and like the history of cartoonists um since it's like a little bit less financial risk mm -hmm. on their part to do that mm -hmm. um but even then it's like that stuff's also based on donors and it's mm -hmm. like if someone who has this piece in their collection it, if it goes in a museum then their piece is now worth more it's like such a crazy twisted world yeah of um, course. <laughs> i mean every world is in its own particular way yeah yeah, yeah. And I feel like there is this, you know, like, that's one reason why, like, I will never stop making books, uh -huh. I think, because it's a structure that I really love and support and it's accessible. Mm -hmm. And, like, even, you know, I can, I've self-published so much of my own work mm -hmm. and I can do that always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really exciting to me. Whereas, like, I might, you know, I might not have enough money to, like, frame some work for a show or something, but, like, I can go print a zine of, mm. like, drawings mm -hmm. um, and, like, give it out or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. 
What was the question again? Like, oh, well, I guess it was just a kind of like a provocative question of like, you know, like, is it, ne is it yeah. necessary to double track your work in some way if you want to participate in the comics world and our world I, still? I think it's like, I, I was, there's like this Edward Gorey quote I always think of where people were like, are you a writer? Are you an artist? Like, what is, are you a, a children's bookmaker? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, well, I'm just like, I'm a human. <laughs> and I just happen to do these things. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I just, I, I'm, I have a lot of interest in doing lots of different stuff. And I do think that just doing comics after a while, well, comics take so much time. And mm -hmm. to me, they take so much planning, so labor intensive mm -hmm. that, it, you know, at times, I, I think finishing the book that just came out at the end, it felt like I was like hitting my head against the wall. It was so much work. Mm -hmm. And I got a little exhausted by doing it. Mm -hmm. And I like just, I like making drawings and I like making imagery. And then, I think, um, I was like, well, what if I um, really just focus on that for a while and see mm -hmm. how that feels? And it felt, it was, it felt great to do. And I think, I think any, anything that you have ambition to do, you have to really commit to it, at, or at least for me, I, you really want to focus on it. And so now I kind of want to focus on both and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's, um, I, you know, I've, I've been making in studio now these large, um, painted pages that have that will at the end function as a comic which I just I just want to see how that turns out yeah and I I do think it's been fun to do because like when I make imagery in sequence it, it starts activating in a different way mm -hmm. um but I don't know I you know I don't know if I would want to do comics like that all the time mm -hmm. um I so I don't but I think you can totally do that oh you I think there's a lot of potential yeah. in that area I mean like like you know I was saying I, I was I've imagined that kind it's of nice thing to see this, and seeing but... like this work by Aiden it was just kind of like oh here's someone who's actually starting to yeah. make some things that gesture in that direction and even like in in um you know Blaze's book even though it's a kind of artifice I mean it does gesture in that direction yeah I I, I asked someone uh who I would uh it, I you know I'd put weight in his thoughts on it and he said I mean at least you can do anything, but in terms of what a gallery would want, like uh, like specific actors, like desires, it's like collectors don't want like uh, I don't know pieces of a puzzle. They want like piece a piece of like the thing is like a piece of like being an aspect of a whole thing. It just doesn't work. Um, but making art is not. No, no, no. I mean, it shouldn't be that. Shouldn't be the focus. Yeah. yeah. No. Sorry. I even, <laughs> no, I know that's not. No, right. no, 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 no. Because we, we all get into whoa, it. We're, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. we're like, oh, if we're, if, are you if catering making, to collect? No, yeah. yeah if it's like it. making art. It's like, oh, you're making it. So, like, what, what will? How do you get into a gallery? What's a gallery is accept? And it is. I mean, it's it's such a hard. I mean, it's the same in comics. It's like, oh, I'm going to make this comic. Like, what do comics publishers normally work? With? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but we've all made comics that are not like what. Comics publishers typically somehow it's yeah. worked out. be into, but somehow it's worked out. <laughs> uh, so, and yeah, I mean, I think I think it's like the art world is so vast, and there's like some the stuff that's like maybe more people know is like the Batman and Superman of the art world. We see this stuff like Jeff Koons, and we're like, oh, that's the art world. Mm -hmm. But the comics world isn't just Batman and Superman. There's there's all these different people, and the art world is like that too. There's all these you can I don't know. It's just a whole. It's so. Yeah, and it's really stimulating mm -hmm. on, in such a different way mm -hmm. to like just consider how something sequentially can engage a space. Mm -hmm. Like just being mm -hmm. like, oh, here's like, I mean, I yeah, I feel like half the time I just, I get really excited about the various challenges mm -hmm. um, that are presented to me or that I've like kind of sought out. Mm -hmm. But even in terms of like definitions, um, I mean, yeah, it's been... I, you know, I say comics, but there's definitely come up multiple times where it's like someone from literature or something is like, oh, but it's poetry or something. Or it's like mm. visual poetry. I'm like, sure. Um, <laughs> and like people from, I've like talked to more cinema people recently too, or like directors who are like, I really, it's so, it's just like a film. I'm like, sure. Great. Um, <laughs> I think it's just like let it, having the openness to let people see what they mm -hmm. can yeah. understand in your work good, is important mm -hmm. um, instead of being strict and being like, no, it's a comic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it's. I think people can see so much, so many different things mm -hmm. in sequential work. And so, like, l just let them do it. Yeah. 
Oh, and often that's what people, I didn't mean to interrupt, often that's what people who are curating exhibits or, or curating shows are doing anyway. They're thinking of what order you're looking at it in and, and things like that, but just in a more abstracted kind of way. What were you going to say? Just reminding that this is Aiden the cartoonist right now that you're like <laughs> laughing along with. Like you're thinking she's just like me. She's this cartoonist. Aiden like, number seven. That's who she really is. Yes, yes. But it's true. We're also relaxed in the setting because it's the comics yeah. world. And it's true. Understanding. We don't have to like seem cool. Or yeah. Anything. yeah. <laughs> we have time uh, to take one or two questions if anybody wanted to ask one. Anyone in the audience wanted to ask anybody? Even if just not about the subjects, about any of these artists' work or anything. Yes? I mean, I feel like you've made one of the most successful web comics I know, which was 2001. Um, ready with this. You, yeah, I know. Honestly. Boom. Um, <laughs> which was so exciting because I don't really think about web comics that much, but I feel like, I mean, Blaze can tell you about more, but I feel like he actually like utilized that the functionality of that space in a way that I have not really seen. Aiden's probably the most popular on the internet, <laughs> just notes-wise, and she doesn't do it herself. It's all, like, she, the work is others do it for her. Like, somehow these images just get circulating. They get massive amounts of notes on any image sharing. Well, when I was looking on Tumblr, actually, um, the, there was a page from the most recent thing that was posted of your work, I think, it was tagged with your name, was a page from this story. Oh my that I think, it's really made the rounds. Which is old, like wow. older, yeah, not old, but you know, it's I mean, older it's from like 2000, I don't know what, like nine or 10 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 2009. And I think only existed on Flickr. I don't think it was ever printed. It, I could be wrong. Or maybe it was I an made anthology it for, or something. Oh, it was, it was on, well, it was on the Arthur Magazine website. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> that's how you know it's old. Um, yeah, but that's where it was. And it was definitely, I'm sure I put it on Flickr. But yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't expect to ever see it again. Mm-hmm. I didn't need to. Right. And there it is. But the pieces that you've made that have been online, they've been online, but, I mean, they could just as easily be in a book or something like that. Like, The Blonde Woman, for example, I think I have pages from. That was serialized online. Mm-hmm. But it, the ultimate destination was the book form. Whereas Blaze, with 2001, you're really using scrolling, for example, and, and background images. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I I love that comic, and that's like, when I look at that, I'm like, oh, there's some, Blaze really thought about what you can do with web comics mm-hmm. with that, in a way that I just, I would never think of that. And I just, it's, I, when I see successful web comics like that, or, or other ones that are, are interesting, I just, it's hard for me to think of how to do that, or, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I mean, it, again, it's exciting, because you see potential in where web comics could go that yeah. they're just like not mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. everything sorry I didn't mean to interrupt if you could like project where web comics could go what would you want to see in the future possibly I don't know I mean I think that it's just thinking about what like what tools do you have available when you're creating something online so I mean I mean kind of like I don't know like choose your own adventure style like, maybe that exists already but finding, you know, ways to, like, dig yourself into some kind of deep narrative um, visually and, like, functionally instead of just, like, scroll, like, clicking to a next page over and over or something. You know, something that's immersive to that platform. I think webcoms are more used, like, as a, a good way to share your work with with people. Uh, I, I, I don't see many formalist webcomics outside of, like, Blazes and a few other, although I'm not looking at everything. But I do think like Instagram and Tumblr are kind of changing having your own website where you, because I, I love sharing work in progress and and just pages of art online. And I think that's, I, I mean, that's, I, I like when I go onto Tumblr and some interesting cartoonist has just uploaded a whole story and it's just like a surprise. And mm-hmm. But I don't think of them as, as saying I'm doing work for the web. It's just kind of a way to be like, and because yeah. also comics take so long, it's like, well, I haven't, um, I don't have a book coming out for a while. You haven't seen it, but look, <laughs> yes, I am working yeah. on this, and it's, it's, and I think that's actually really important um, in having belief in your own work or just uh, having people see it, and and also just for people to read it and be influenced by it as it's in progress, you know, or day to day. You take one more, yes. Okay. 
Um, kind of devil's advocate argument that comics succeed or fail based on the content, and art is more about the theory or the context. Do you agree, disagree? I think art is like, I think of it as like this creating this void and there's different kinds of art, everything's welcome, but ultimately it's, like, it's not about having a statement, it's the opposite. It's like a way in which you're able to create non-language and like it's a, a word, it's a thing, but it doesn't mean anything. It's its own meaning. It embodies itself. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it seems like comics the opposite. Well said. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, there's so many different approaches um, that it is hard to say with art, just because I'm, I mean, yeah, I know so many, like, um, theoretical artists, but also, like, illustrative artists. I mean, just, yeah, or, like, artists who... No, but I mean illustrative fine artists. Um, and even like, uh, you know, the, yeah, there's just so many ways that I see people approach work. I mean, some art is just like creating a world. Like, I feel like I see a lot of that, maybe more in painting almost of like, you know, some kind of immersive experience and that's the point of it. Um, which I guess the comics kind of do that. Um, but then, yeah, and then like highly, highly conceptual work that it's... I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think the caricature of the art world is that it's all theory. Yeah. And there's a lot of theory in it, but I think there's so much that is like anti-theory or or just modernist work being done now. I, you know, and comics are the same way. The the caricature of the comics world is that um that it's just that, that it's all content but I mean you look at a lot of what Blaze is doing and there's a lot of theory behind it and mm -hmm. yeah I mean um, but yeah I, I do think that that people think there's just that, that the art world, art world equals theory and complicated ideas I think it um, I think it keeps a lot of people I, maybe that's the thing with it. it would be cool if there were some crazy cat things in MoMA because that, that would just expand people's idea of what fine art is you know and it's like there's Moreau's in there. That's pretty, there's beautiful, emotional, deep work. But it's also, I think anyone in this day and age can look at it and be like affected by it without understanding what the theory behind it is. And there's a lot of contemporary work being made like that. Like there's, there's so much of it. I think too when you present, like the way it becomes a character, if you present something that has no meaning attached other than itself, then everyone's just wanting to throw words onto it. Like you're mm -hmm. just... Mm -hmm. like, the so left brain it. wants to come in and sort of rationalize yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the only other thing I just wanted to add before we break is I, I, I have a hard time, too, just with the idea that comics are all about content because ultimately the content of, like, some of these great comics is if you were to adapt it into, like, a prose book, it, there wouldn't really be much to it. Um, it would be insane. But, I mean, the real all, <laughs> all, all of the pleasure of something like this comes from the aesthetics. So... Anyway, didn't mean to give myself the last word or anything, yeah. but we do. We are out of time, so please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today.